Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me tonight are... Joe. And I'm Kyle with uh, Elite Machine Works. Welcome, Kyle. We've been wanting to... This is our third time trying to record this episode. <laughs> third time's <laughs> charm. So we're just going to own that, huh? <laughs> Let's hope. <laughs> All right. So uh, <laughs> what are you guys drinking tonight? Tonight... I have a Wizard is Never Late by Triptych Brewing. Road in this to arrive in the same place, combining pale British and American and German malts with copious amounts of citra and Apollo hops. We've once again some of a familiar th- through the golden haze filled with dank notes of fruit and green. You suddenly recall that our beers always arrive precisely when they mean to which sometimes means not at all. And I am drinking on Yingling, which which nice. is a is a surprise. I you know. I wasn't drinking that two nights ago. No. <laughs> I am a big fan of this beer. It's much better than Wake Up Neo, which disappoints me because it had such a great name and can. You failed me on that one, Triptych. It's like a IPA mixed with a sour on that one. This one tastes a lot like Dank Meme, but a little more hoppy. I've got the Three Floyds Laser Snake. Ooh. I only have one left. I have some Gumball Head waiting for me. Kyle, why don't you uh, introduce yourself to everyone first? All right. Well, uh, my name is Kyle Stone. I run Elite Machine Works, and I build custom high-end 3D printers for clients looking for machines that will meet their needs. I am about to hopefully release my first kit version of one of my designs. So Nice. Excellent. Uh, I started out as a machine shop and design service. Um, <clears throat> so the goal was to have people that had ideas for a product. They would come to me. I would help them with the design work, make them a prototype, and then I would do like a small production run for them. And then if everything was successful, I would get them set up with a larger manufacturer. That didn't pan out how I planned. So uh, I opened the shop uh, back in 2014 after I had done some freelance design work that turned out to be really good. And the next phase was to open my own shop. Did a lot of research on equipment and everything, and I bought a Fidel 4020 mil and a Hardinge turret lathe, Hardinge Conquest 42. And that was, yeah, that was almost five years ago. And after I got that equipment, I taught myself how to use it and everything. And then I was like, I should probably get some better experience machining. So I actually went and worked for a small job shop in town and i worked for them for two years where i was a tool and die engineer nice did a lot of did a lot of design work for local manufacturing firms i would do the design the fixturing and then i would uh, go out into the shop and machine it as well and then a lot of the products that they were already making at that job shop when i came in i i redid a lot of their programming and the owner of that shop i have nothing bad to say about him he's a good guy but uh he was big on one part at a time and his machines and he had nice machines he had like a haas vf4 haas uh tool room mill and a haas lathe and he was just all about running one part at a time so i redid a lot of his programming and designed a lot of fixtures to really up his uh production capabilities okay and parts per cycle so after i worked there for two years um i decided to come back to my shop and and give it a go and and try and get it off the ground that was back in 20 2017 kind of fell into the 3d printer thing i I designed my own 3d printer and built it and some i would post it up on reddit and stuff and facebook and people started contacting me asking if i i would be willing to make them a custom printer and i said sure that that sounds like fun i'll do that so i started doing that and it kind of kind of went from there and uh, designed a, a printer for myself and that that's the one that's kind of blown up on on Twitter right now is that one. And that one that one's actually been around for 3 years. So there's there's people on Twitter commenting that the that printer won't work and the belted Z won't work, but <laughs> it's they don't know that it's been around for 3 years and I've been using 5 of them <laughs> for have thousands thousands of print hours on it and a lot of my custom client printers have the same belted Z setup. So it it works and it works great. That's just like your opinion, man. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the Twitter last night, people were, were commenting and I was commenting about the Ender 3 and the MK3. And I made the comment that I don't have any commercial 3D printers. Every 3D printer that I own is, is one that I've designed and fabricated myself. So I don't, I don't have any experience with, um, with any commercially available 3D printer. I kind of want to get one now. I kind of really, I really want an NK3. Um, I do too. You don't, you don't have no. one, Joe? I thought you would. No. Really? I have a, uh, I have a Mark II. I have a Taz 6. And as of yesterday, I have an Ender 3. And, uh, cause I found it for $160 on Woot. And I was like, sure, let's try that. And, uh, the rest of them are either beta machines like my tool changer or machines I designed and built myself. Okay. Nice. Have you, um, any critiques of the, have you gotten to Ender 3 yet? Yes. I, uh, I built it yesterday while, uh, watching the new Veronica Mars, which is excellent. Uh, <laughs> and, um, I'll just say the thing really makes me mad because for $160, that thing prints so damn well for a thousand dollars. It prints so damn well. I, the first print, like I, I, I built it, I plugged it in and I said that name on that SD card looks like a print that might run and I printed it and it worked and it worked really, really good. And now I'm just angry. That would, yeah. Well, especially in my position, if I if I bought a hundred sixty dollar printer and it and it printed as good as one of my machines, I'd, I'd be like, well, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> Here's the thing, you know, I spent probably twenty minutes leveling the bed before I hit print, and then I tweak the bed, in a skirt, and you know that was a fresh build. Who knows how that thing's going to print a hundred print hours from now? Who knows? The the reliability probably isn't there. Oh yeah, well, let's we're gonna dive into some really nerdy three D printer mechanics. So I hope you guys are ready because I have some serious <laughs> critiques on the components that are currently used, the pulleys. I have yeah, I I don't get to talk to people about this kind of stuff about the really nitty gritty details in the three D printing current three D printing scene that I really wish there would be some improvements. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's there are some components that are widely used that I really wish somebody would step their game up and uh, provide some quality components in certain areas. Because that's, that's where I find that my machines are, are lacking. My, my designs are, are pushing the limits of what the individual components are capable of that I'm, that I'm getting. So. Okay. Elaborate. All right, here we go. Uh, the pulleys, for one. Um, I'm really happy to see E3D finally offer some good quality pulleys. What I'm not happy about is they only come in five millimeter bores, and I'm really not happy that they don't offer more uh, sizes. Uh, I, I would like to see a 30 tooth, a 32 tooth, a 40 tooth, a 60 tooth, an 80 tooth, pretty much everything full up to like catalog. 100 tooth. Um, yes, yeah, a full catalog. Uh, <clears throat> I understand that that's probably a, a big undertaking for them, but I've, I order a lot of pulleys from China, and it's mm-hmm. it's hit and miss. Yep. I can't stand the run out in these bullies. I can't stand the the flanges, how they're not pressed on all the way. It's just I have clients spending a lot of money on these machines and if a pulley has a wobbly flange or something, it just it it right. doesn't sit right with me. So I can there's BB manufacturing here in the States. They make great stuff, but fifteen dollars a pulley and my machines, some of them have up to ten to fifteen pulleys on them, that's gonna add significantly to the cost of those machines. So I've been buying the E3D pulley or yeah, pulleys, and I've been actually boring them out on my lathe to eight millimeters because people are, uh, people will be like, you didn't, that's not an E3D pulley. You can't get that in eight millimeter. I'm like, well, yeah, I, I had to bore them out on my lathe. <laughs> well, so. so all of the gates components that they're carrying are components that are used in the tool changer. Nice. That's where that deal came from was we're going to use these components in our machines. We may as well resell them to our customers because we're going to release all these designs open source. You know, maybe there's plans to to dive into that deeper later. I don't know. I hope so, because that's it's a struggle. Uh, It's the devil's in the details, really. And I've 
I found it like Robot Dig. I would order a lot of pulleys from Robot Dig because they're very reasonable on their prices and they do DHL shipping, which gets mm-hmm. here in like a few days, which is great. A lot of those, their pulleys will actually walk on the shafts. So a lot of my machines have very, very tight belt tension. Any run out or slop in that pulley bore will actually cause that pulley to mm-hmm. wobble on the shaft. And you can get those set screws as tight as you want to get them, but it doesn't matter. That that walking motion creates a lot of force and stress, and it'll chew up hard and steel shafts and everything. So I've actually had to... Um, now I do it regardless, but I'll actually use um, Loctite retaining compound on a lot of my pulleys, yeah. and they're permanent. So if I tell a client, hey, if that motor fails, or if you break up that pulley or something... You're just going to have to replace that motor because that pulley is permanently mounted to that motor well, shaft. If you're doing that, have you looked into pressed on pulleys? You're just getting the pulleys pressed on at the motor factory? I, I haven't. Um, it's just I'm, I'm doing such small quantities that it probably wouldn't be worth it. It probably would be if I would had the mindset of, you know, ordering a bunch of them and yeah. just having them in stock. You know, I do a lot of custom machines and there's there's no telling, you know, what you know, what each machine might, might need. So it would be, a, I would have to order a variance of, of components. What about you pressing them on? I would, if somebody would make a, a, a press on pulley. Oh yeah. I could, I would be fine with pressing them on. But then again, that means that they would have to have really tight manufacturing tolerances and pulleys are kind of uh, mm-hmm. tossed to the side in a way. I'm really kind of curious, like uh, Prusa, I wonder where he's he's sourcing his components. I think for a while he was getting like his linear bearings and stuff from Misumi, which I use Misumi in, in my machines. Misumi I'm pretty sure his stuff. motors come from Moons or LDO. Um, okay. And LDO has recently made a huge push into the printer market and for like either small quantities or just trying to support people like you. So maybe they would be a good one to contact. I'll look into that for sure, because I'm pretty sure they're going to be at Earth. Just saying. Hmm. I need to talk to uh, somebody who was t- telling me the other day that I need to talk to Dave. Yeah, you should. So He's a great dude. Awesome, because uh, trying to really break into the market and make a name for myself, and this is what I do full time now. So I'm going to be leaning a lot on other members in the community that, that run small businesses and that can kind of show me the way, because... There's, there's gonna, there are a lot of unknowns for me right now. Um, especially I'm looking to manufacture kits and, and expand. So I need to make some connections because I got to make some wire harnesses. I got to find somebody to make some wiring harnesses. I don't have connections in the wiring harness world. I like to do as much as I can in house on the manufacturing side of things, but there are just some things I can't manufacture in house, like, like wiring harnesses. So did wire stripping machines are relatively cheap though. They're so fun. They're I've so fun. Test. And I've looked at um, crimping machines and, and stuff like that, too, because I have a box full of wire crimpers that I've just... I'll go out and I'll buy, buy like, the cheap ones on Amazon and try them out, and I'll go through, like, five or ten of those until I find a good one that works for the certain type of terminal that I like to work with. And I've got... I've got a, a nice selection, and I've... Well, I want to make some YouTube videos, too, Um but uh, I really want to focus my YouTube videos on the really technical side of the mechanical okay. uh, makeup of 3D printers, like the pulley discussion that we just had. I, like, I, I want to I get a printer that's popular and break it down and be like, this motor is only 57 ounce <laughs> inches. This, it's not good enough. Or these pulleys have a lot of run out. You, you should get an belts. under three. You'd have a lot of things to say. I have a lot of things to say, but it also made a good print. <laughs> um not to dive away from the crimping topic or, or to dive back into that real quick. Did you hear our interview with Tim Hatch at Murph this year? Okay, so Tim, I haven't, I haven't is, heard he heard works for yet. Google and he runs a lot of their internal maker spaces. But Tim in the maker world himself is obsessed with crimping and crimp connections and different types of sockets and pens and the crimpers involved with them. Oh god, yeah, I could I could talk to that guy all day long. You really could. He's he's just a really great dude. And I met him at Murph was that three years ago, Aaron, when we brought Maz of the first year? 
And he showed me these amazing crimpers that he had gotten that were, uh, they were prototypes, I think, for the English military that he had found on eBay. And they, they were the only ones he had ever found. And um, he, you know, sometime in the last three years, he found another set of them and he brought them to me at Murph this year and they're in my toolbox behind me and they, pr- they crimp um, the knockoff DuPont pins really, really well. Oh, and oh, um, yeah. I could the, yep. uh, the Molex pins that Lulz by uses it print, they crimp those extremely well. Uh, so I was ecstatic to get those crimpers. And if my headphones reached, I would show them to you. Uh, <laughs> If I remember correctly, he tracked it down to some Canadian, yes. uh, like air air like a airplane supplier. Yeah, he had to get set up as a supplier in their system just to order them. <laughs> They're like, we don't know how to handle individual orders. They're like, you don't want a thousand pairs of these crimpers. So Tim, if you're listening, I I have used your crimpers many times. I'm getting ready to use them again in the next week or two. If they work great. Thank you so much. And we have to introduce you to Kyle. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could. I assemble so many printers. Well, I mean, I cut my teeth working on Jeeps and stuff. And I did. I was always the guy to do it with the electrical. So back in 2012, I actually went to work for a local off road shop. And they had a Jeep in that was a very specialized custom Jeep. The guy that was spending money on this Jeep, we'll just say that he owned, he owned the lawyer firm in Florida. So this guy had money and he was dropping serious money on this Jeep. And he had just about anything electrical that you could add to a Jeep he had on this Jeep. And I did all the wiring in that Jeep. And I did a lot of crimping, a lot of stripping. And yeah, well, that and I mean, I had a 2006 Wrangler that I put a Chevy LS engine in. And instead of going out and buying like a conversion wiring harness, I took the wiring harness from the Chevy Chevy engine and I laid it out on two card tables upstairs in my house and I branched it out and everything and I made the conversion harness myself just looking at the the GM service manual and the Jeep service manuals just comparing the two because wiring doesn't bother me it 99% of everybody else it bothers but I could I can wire all day and it just doesn't bother me because it's, it's just I like I don't know it's just I like making nice pretty wired connections I am I am not good at making wiring pretty i'm good at making wiring work but not pretty it just it takes it practice it, it is frustrating well i i cut my teeth in car audio world so same deal just you know a little less detrimental if you screw things up <laughs> yeah <laughs> our speakers don't work so what else besides the pulleys do you have issues with well, the idlers <laughs> Dude, it's good to find a good idler that doesn't have any run out. Motors are fine. Step like the cheapest stepper motors is is good yeah. enough. It's it's amazing how cheap they can make these stepper motors and they just work great and they're reliable. But I still buy the the semi expensive stepper motors. And then some of the Core XY, I have a lot of I have a lot of things to say about Core XY and how certain people are using the Core XY mechanics in their builds. Core XY is Core XY is great. For a small build volume, I would say a small build volume being like anything 200 millimeter square. And I see a lot of guys building these very large Core XY printers, me included. I built a large Core XY. I know what I'm talking about. Or I have experience. Um, so they're, they're building these big Core XY printers and they're only using six millimeter wide belts. Okay. What well, at anything over 300 millimeter square print area, you're, your Y gantry is pretty heavy and you're doing all that core X Y geometry just to eliminate the mass of one NEMA 17 stepper motor when it's negligible compared to the mass of the gantry that you're moving around yep. anyways. Yep. <laughs> and you're going to have belt stretch because your belts are so dang long now that even though you eliminated the mass of that one stepper motor, yep. you're still screwed. And even if you do it, if your belts aren't perfectly balanced, perfectly balanced, you're going to get ovals and rhombuses <laughs> instead of circles and oh, squares. Oh god. Yep. And the tensioning too. They don't it's these guys are building the core XY and they've never had a core XY and they don't know the nightmares of tensioning the core XY belts and how it can skew mm-hmm. the gantry. 
I learned all those lessons the hard way. Don't worry. I didn't come in like I wasn't the expert before. <laughs> I had to build one and find out yep. <laughs> this out myself. Well, you, you know how to tension the belts right, right? I um I built two fixtures and each little fixture held like a dial indicator and I brought the gantry up to those dial indicators and zeroed it out without any belt tension and then I, as I tensioned the belts I would look at the dial indicators and that's how okay. I tensioned my belts. So you you did it way better than me. But the you know, the, the secret is oh. I'm a machinist by trade, so <laughs> hold in tight to the side that will let it be loose when you tension one belt. And you tension one belt until it's tight, and then you tension the other belt until it pulls the gantry square again. Then <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and then, I gotcha. you now if you're like Kyle, you use a dial on the gear. I use a small <laughs> scale because Let's face it, we're printing plastic trinkets at the end of the day. <laughs> we are. I get that. I, I get a lot of criticism for machines being overkill. I understand. Uh, I just don't like to leave anything to chance. So that's that's actually part of my design philosophy is I'll brute force and I'll overkill if it's within the budget or within yeah. the design parameters. Um, and I just you spend so much time on the design and it's already going to be a custom printer. You're already going to be spending some money. So I just want to make sure that it's going to work. I mean, I could spend hours doing the finite element analysis and everything. And yeah, I would have to do that if I was producing a thousand or tens of thousands of machines for a company that was looking to cut costs wherever possible and still make a great machine. But that's just, that takes a lot of time and it's just, it's easier just to yes. make it overkill. And and your printers are beautiful and they make beautiful things. Thank you. I like to I like to make them look nice. Um because when well, you can you can see them behind me. Let's whenever I walk into the office or whenever one of my clients works into their work area where they have the printer, I want them to look at that printer and, and be like, Damn, yes. that's a good looking printer. So. Most of my experiments over the last couple of years have been literally flying in the face of what you're doing. <laughs> of just being like well i've been wanting to make like a universal test bed too for for some mechanics and and designs that i that i have planned for like a it's kind of hard to describe but like a universal test platform okay for 3d printer mechanics and stuff i haven't really figured out how to do that because there's so many variances and stuff but uh you know it would be great to have like a, a universal test platform to test out like a Z a Z system or um a bit a big Y bed moving system or something like that. I just Ooh. it's a project I've been thinking about doing, but I just have So you brought up a really good topic just now. The Y bed moving. Oh, yeah, I get a lot of criticism for that too. Okay. I give my clients the options to to do different styles of 3D printers. Um it just so happens all of my clients so far have been okay with the big bed moving setup that the i3 platform or whatever. Most of my clients are printing so far are just printing large flat objects. So it, it, the, the i3 platform works great for them. Um, and that, again, that, that comes back to my philosophy of just brute force. All right. Well, you want to move in bed, you're going to get a move in bed yeah. and it's going to be damn rigid. <laughs> So bring that <laughs> up. And I like doing that. Like it's kind of, it's kind of like a, whoa. it's cool to have like a big massive bed and, and be, move it fast and precise. I'll, it's a, it's a fun challenge uh, for sure. Uh, Cause, um, okay. So if you want to know about my printers, you can go to elite and there's a tab there called projects. And it goes over all the printers I've built to current. So I'm going to start throwing out some printer names and, you know, nobody's going to know what I'm talking about, but if you go to my website and go to the projects, you'll, you'll definitely be able to follow along. All right. So the beast was the, the first large moving bed printer that I designed and built for a client. And the beast has a 320 ounce inch NEMA 24 stepper motor on it that drives the bed. Um, and it has a NEMA 24 because I have a friend that works for a certain industry that this industry, if a machine doesn't work right, one component on the machine breaks, uh. they threw the whole machine out. 
and he has access to these components and he he uh he makes some friendly <laughs> donations <laughs> to my parts part supplies so i have some very nice i had some very nice nema um uh, 24 vexta oriental motor co stepper motors and i was like that's perfect so that's that's what i used for the the bed on that printer and it it'll shake that yeah it'll it'll shake it around pretty good uh, so you drove two belts with a dual shaft stepper. Yes. Uh, the old ham couplers. Yeah. And you'll notice that I support the the pulleys. Oh, that's another issue I have too. With companies and individuals building printers, they do not support mm-hmm. the pulleys correctly. And that it's going to that's gonna cause the belt to ride up on the pulley. And it's just, from an engineering standpoint, it drives me nuts when I see an improperly supported pulley. I want that thing supported on both sides. Yeah, you shouldn't be loading the motor shaft with a belt. No, you should not. The motor should only see rotational torque. It shouldn't see any... I mean, yeah, you can, you can put an axial load on those bearings, but if you look at professionally designed industrial machines, they do not load the motors axially. They isolate all the stresses in the machine from from the motor as much as they can. And they're they're just designing, they're implementing the motor in a way that the motor only sees rotational torque. And that's the, the proper way to do it. I want, when I design a machine, I want all the mechanical components to be happy. So this machine really highlights, like, the main thing that I always try to convey when people complain about the, the, the moving Y bed is the gantry is going to be the stiffest in that locked position and that moving Y bed. Yes. It really doesn't matter. It doesn't. And the machine can shake around all at once on the beast. And it's, it's really not going to affect the print quality because it's such a rigid machine. I've got the back, uh, the carbon braces on the back that lock, you know, the, the Z uprights and help lock that gantry into any vibrations. So if one part of the machine is going to vibrate, everything else in the machine is going to vibrate the same way. I have thought about bolting some of my printers to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, have you ever looked at um, Titan Robotics printers? I, oh, I have not. There are a, a printer manufacturer in Colorado that does uh, large format printers. They do pellet extrusion oh. um, on their printers, and they also do filament extrusion. Uh, but like, they are building printers similar to yours, but taking it a scale higher um they they're building i3 style printers that have steel weldments with aluminum mounting pads that have been machined with linear rails put in them and then they take it one step farther and they pour sand into the weldments to build as much structural mass as possible i've looked into filling the uh, extrusions in my printers i've looked into filling them with epoxy but epoxy granite yeah Um, (laughs) yep yeah oh man um, yeah hey titan if you guys are hiring uh <laughs> i would be willing to leave all this behind <laughs> um they they're doing some really cool stuff i i was talking to them at imts this year or this this past last year and they were running their i3 style printer which it was like a 12 by 24 uh bed mm-hmm. but they're using yaskawa drives oh, on, oh on my God. all the axes hell yeah and uh, I can't remember the acceleration that they were running, but it was absolutely insane. You could feel the direction changes in the floor. Oh, that sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> and he was telling me this printer weighed around 1,500 pounds. Hell yeah. And it That's, wasn't yeah. that big. Well, part of my goal is when I build these printers, these bigger printers, is um, I want them to be as heavy as possible. So when you have to move it around, it's... It's you can, fine. You can feel the quality when you have to move it around. You have to have somebody else help you move it around. Yes. <laughs> yeah. A friend of mine and I have been talking about doing something similar where we, we do the weldments with machine pads on a CNC router since we don't have a boring mill available to us to be able to do everything <laughs> and um, you know, be able to bolt the gantry down and should be able to get it pretty close to square or at least be able to shim it in and 
be able to build some really massive stuff like that. Yeah, see the the foundation on the beast. I actually put that the um, the base of that whole printer into my CNC machine and machined like the areas where the Z uprights are placed. And I've actually thought about upgrading the beast to linear rails because it's that uh, you know, that the base of it fits in my CNC machine, so I could easily um, <clears throat> put add some aluminum to that base and then machine that aluminum. Yeah, for linear rails, thought about doing that. Because even though it's got 20 millimeter rods on it, that bed, I still get some vibrations to that bed and it shows up in print artifacts. And I can definitely tell it's because of those 20 millimeter linear rods. And they're 600 millimeters long. Uh, yeah, I could see them flexing a little bit. They, yeah, it's everything is a spring. So <laughs> it's it's overkill. I know. I, I think about this stuff way too much. It's, it's way overkill. But every single printer that I build gets gets machined. I even order like the extrusion. I don't order. I don't order it saw cut to the length that the design is. I order it five millimeters over, so I can put it in my CNC mill and mill the ends to precise length because I want it. I want it to be as simple to square as possible. Even like I won't put linear rails on any of my printers that I haven't machined slots for yet in the aluminum extrusion. And it's just, I mean. That that Fidel forty twenty will rigid tap all those holes for me, so that's that's nothing for me to to add some linear rails to some stuff. So, how do you feel about the printer designs that just have a linear rail floating out in the air, not mounted to anything? He just froze. Um, I I think yeah. I broke his brain. I, I heard what you <laughs> said. Yeah, I, people I, do that. I heard what you said. It, Joe, yeah. Uh, no, oh I want to narrate it for our audience. <laughs> when now he's yeah. now he's pinching his his nose like with frustration. <laughs> it's just I get it. I have a lot of respect for people that can build things in their garage. I have a lot of respect for that. But what about the companies that are selling this as a product? Oh God, uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're just <laughs> well, they're they're seeing the three D printer craze and they're like, hey, we can make a quick buck here. And uh, there's a lot of companies that are doing that. Uh, I was on Reddit the other day, and some guy was posting up this printer that his company just bought. Spent a lot of money on it, and they had to assemble it. And it was like, it was a huge printer. It's like a Modix or something, like a Modix V120. I don't, and I was looking at their website, and they're doing everything I've, I've already said that is awful. Like, they're unsupported pulleys, and I, it, you can tell that, this company is just trying to make a quick buck, and the the only selling feature of this machine they're relying on is just the sheer size of it. And sure enough, people were uh, chiming in and in the Reddit thread, being like, "Yeah, uh, my company has one of those. It's, it's a piece of shit." <laughs> 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 and I'm, I'm thinking, "Yeah, that looks like it would would not print well at all." You could tell it was an eight bit controller too, because the uh, LCD screen on it. Ah, uh, yeah. It's 2019. We've got 32-bit controllers. To counter that, I went to talk to a company today that had a MakerBot Z18 that just doesn't work. Mm. And, you know, that's a $6,000 paperweight, essentially. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, I, I offered to recontrol it with a Duet and put a good extruder in it, make it a really solid printer. They kind of shuddered. <laughs> 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 But, you know, that's an option, I guess. I... <laughs> so, Kyle, would you uh, be able to talk a bit about your plans for your kits? Yes. Okay. So, I hope to offer a fully fledged kit. I cannot do that right now. So, at first, it's just going to be a bare bones kit. Um, I'm going to release the design open source, and I'm going to sell you uh, the frame because the frame's all machine. Nobody can really make that in a garage. So I'm going to show you the, the machined extrusion frame, uh, the linear rails and rods and the power supplies too. I'm going to, going to sell the power supplies cause I use a, I call it a power supply module cause I don't use what everybody else is using for power supplies in my printers. Well, I'll cover that in a minute. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to sell you the heat bed too. Cause I make the heat beds in house. It's Mike six heat bed, uh, with a Kidovo heat pad and the heat beds are, I will not sell you a printer where the heat bed is heated by the power supply. I will not do that. AC power all the way. And people are afraid of using AC power to heat their beds. It is much, much safer than running all that amperage through those wires. Yeah. 
As long as you have a good solid state relay. Yeah. Uh, well. Oh yeah, we're gonna get to that too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I don't Just use any. Want to ele- clarify? <laughs> I don't use any electronics that are cheap. All of my electronics are neighboring electronics. Even the uh, little power plug at the, that has the power switch and everything. It's a Schroeder. Um, it's a reputable power entry module. And the power supply I use, I'm letting all my secrets out. So, um, so since my beds are heated, you know, by the, the mains power, I can get away with running a much smaller power supply. And my kit runs on 120 watt medical mean well power supply. It's only a $20 power supply and they're rock solid. Nice. It's awesome. And it's, and then, well, the reason I picked that power supply too is because it's only two inches by four inches form factor. It's really small. Okay. And then the SSR is, I use an Omron, uh, low profile SSR, and it doesn't add screw terminals on it. It has the, uh, the quarter inch tabs on it. Okay. For the heat bed. And then the, it, so all of these components, the power entry module, the power supply, and the Omron solid state relay go into a, an enclosure. And that enclosure makes up what I call the, the, the power module. And that enclosure has a six pin Molex mini fit junior connector on it that so you can easily remove it from the printer uh, if you need to nice and if anything ever happens to it i could send you a whole new power module and all you have to do is just quickly unplug yours and send it to me but i mean i don't think you're gonna have any problems with it i've been running these printers for three years and i've run multiples of these printers for three years tens of thousands of print hours and i leave my printers unattended printing at my shop over the weekends it's not i mean it's rare that i leave and i don't start a print overnight um right i just don't think twice about leaving my printers unattended printing and then when everybody was freaking out over this a net a8 stuff uh, a few years ago i was running my printers and i was thinking oh, I, I leave mine unattended all the time because <laughs> <So. laughs> they're properly specced guys well i still um and that and that's why I I go the extra mile. Uh, I want these things to be safe and reliable, and that's that's why people buy custom printers from me is because it's they're they're buying a reliable machine that's that's gonna meet their standards. Um, and I've, I've honestly been amazed at how good uh, they print and how reliable they are. Sometimes you just kind of stumble across a, a good design that works. So. So what else is in the kit besides, you said it's going to be bare bones, so we'll have just the frame and the uh, power supply module? Yes, uh, and the heat bed. Uh, it, it might have motors. Um, it'll probably have motors. There are going to be Wantai motors, um, and I've used Wantai motors on all, on all of my personal printers, and they're good motors. Um, mm-hmm. They are. Yeah, I went. I went through the... Yeah, it, every, everything has been researched. Don't worry. It's been tried and tested. Um, but yeah, the Wantai motors have been great. And uh, yeah, the linear rails, I almost thought about not including the linear rails or the rods because you can easily order those from Mizumi. But I'm just going to go ahead and include them. Uh, and the X Gantry has high wind rails. Um, depending on demand, uh, the X Gantry might come with the high wind rails on it or it might not. Um, it, if I can keep up the the X gantry, we'll have the high wind rails already mounted and aligned. Because even the X gantry, the the piece of extrusion that I use for the X gantry is machined, and it, there are uh, slots machined in it for the the linear rails. But um, these interchangeable high wind linear rails that everybody thinks are so great, they're they're good, but they vary a lot in size between individual carriages. So even though I've machined the extrusion to be perfectly flat from rail to rail. The carriages are going to be different. Yeah. So if when you bolt the extruder plate onto those carriages, it's going to bind a little bit because there's difference in, in the height of those carriages. And on, on client printers, I have sat down and taken an India stone and, and stoned those carriages out to where they're even, you know, get the, the blue dye on them and, and then you stone them out. Um, but actually, okay. So I get a lot of uh, questions about that too. Why do you, why are you running two linear rails on your X, X axis? These high wind carriage, th- these high wind linear rails and carriages still have play in them. And 
they are the bottom of the barrel variant of the high one linear rails and carriages. Even I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's even what E3D is using. I don't know. Their engineers might have spec'd out uh, to the Z1 spec, which is the medium preload. I'm using the light preload, and there's still a little bit of play in there. Um, and that's why I use two linear rails on my x-axis, is I can preload those linear rails off of each other to take up any slack in the carriages. I actually think um, I think the tool changer is actually using THK rails now. Oh, wow. They they see they learned a the lesson. They know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love Japanese rails a lot. I could I could talk all day about linear rails, too. Um, yep. Uh, <laughs> yep. I love THK. Uh, in Jap- any Japanese linear rail, really. Uh, Nippon bearing, NB uh, rails are great, too. I found... I do a lot of digging on eBay, and I come across a lot of good deals on some linear rails that these people don't know that they have. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I snag them up real quick, especially if it's from a Japanese company. I'll, I'll snag it up real quick and add it to my parts bins. Well, my whole CNC router is THK rails, and I got them as scrap. So, and they were brand new. Uh, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love some Japanese rails. They're, they're just, you they're think, nice. you think high ones are smooth. Wait till you fill some Japanese rails. And I actually bought some. Oh, hang on. Oh, nice. The NSK PS2 Grease. If you're building a 3D printer and you've got some cheap Chinese rails, or you've got some really expensive linear rails, and you want those things to be buttery smooth, get you some NSK PS2 grease, and they'll be smooth. Yeah. You heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> or actually, um, uh, motor oil, like good um, synthetic motor oil is actually pretty good for, for linear rails. On a 3D printer, I wouldn't recommend it like for like a heavy duty like CNC machine or a machine that sees any tool pressure, but for a 3D printer, yeah, you can, you can oil them with... Uh, some good synthetic motor oil, and that's probably better than what the sewing machine oil or, or whatever um, Ultimaker recommends. That's what Haas is actually using now in their big CNC machines. Haas is using uh, the mobile, something like 10W30 synthetic motor oil. Really? Because it, mm-hmm, it doesn't um, it doesn't clog the lines. Uh-huh. Well, they have a contract with, with mobile, so... Um, they were using the mobile Vectra forever and the mobile Vectra kind of gums up the lines and clogs up the filters. And they discovered that the, uh, you know, a good synthetic motor oil doesn't do that. Yeah. I, a long time ago, a machine maintenance guy that I worked with told me that it, if I wanted to lube my ways for any of my machines and just make it easy, just get like a good synthetic motor oil. Um, so I just went out and bought, yeah, like a 10W30 Mobile One. And, and that'll last forever. For that's what I've been... Yeah, I've been using the same court for like seven years. So... <laughs> <laughs> well, they, I mean, think it's synthetic motor oil. I mean, these motor oils, they see... They're designed for internal combustion engines. They see a lot of stress and heat. And yeah. So, linear bearing, that's an easy life for that synthetic motor oil. So, it's going to last a long time. Yeah. We're at the 50-minute mark. I think it's time for last call. I feel like I got really, really nerdy on some topics that we didn't cover everything we were nah. supposed to cover, but oh well. I, I wanted to ask you how you got your start in CNC. So, I, like I said, I cut my teeth in Jeeps, and back in 2007, I really wanted a CNC plastic table, and the cheapest one I could find was only $7,000. I was looking at them, I was like, I could, I could build one. They're pretty, they look pretty simple. So, I got on CNC Zone and found a sub forum on there where people were, were building them back in like, this was 2008 or 2009. It's been a long time. But I remember back in the day, you couldn't find linear rails or anything on eBay. No. I started in 2010. Like, that was the time when, like, CNC software was just beginning. Everyone was still scavenging stepper motors from printers and things like that. Because like, you couldn't buy them on eBay. You couldn't buy pre-built kits. You couldn't buy pre-built controllers. It was madness. Wild West for building the CNC machines. Yep, people makers don't know how good they have it now. <laughs> they don't <laughs> they have to buy. Oh my god, the market is flooded with like high wind NGM nine and twelve style linear rails. Finding those eight or ten years ago, 
Good luck. Yeah. I had to physically go to Motion Industries and place an order for the linear rail on the CNC plasma table that I was building. Like you had so, to show up at a brick and mortar location? Oh, God, I know. Yes, yeah, just couldn't order it off Amazon. It was awful. Had to get out of the house and everything. Back and in talk the worst. <laughs> physically talk to somebody like a sales guy. Oh, man. <laughs> oh. Yeah. But um, I built that, the CNC plasma table. It was a waterbed. And it uh, turned out to be a really good table and learned the basics of, of G-Code when I was building that. And then I was at University of Memphis and I was in mechanical engineering and I was like, I can design stuff all right, but I really want to know how to make the stuff that I design. So I switched my major over to engineering technology and I had a lot of fun in engineering technology. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I was thinking about opening up my CNC machining business, I honestly had no experience programming industrial CNC equipment. So I bought the equipment. I did a lot of research. Fidel's are great machines. If you're out there and you're looking at like a Tormach, a brand new Tormach, and you're about to spend like $25,000 on this Tormach, if you're not afraid to get your hands a little bit dirty and do some work, go out and get a Fidel VMC 15. It can run on single phase 220, and that Fidel is going to run circles around a Tormach. Tormachs are great machines, but value for money. Get you a used Fidel. I just just probably at the the market price for used Fidels, but uh, what what was that? <laughs> they they are great machines. VMC fifteen. VMC fifteen. Just gonna um, write that down. We could do a whole new po- <laughs> another podcast on Fidels. <laughs> so <laughs> sweet. <laughs> it's a, it's a linear way machine, and a good great thing about the linear way Fidels is. From a maintenance standpoint, if the linear rails or anything are worn out, there you can easily replace yeah. them. Uh, but Fidel's definitely known for their boxway machines. My Fidel 4020 is a boxway machine. It's great, but um, I've got some scoring on my Y boxway, and I'm really kind of nervous that the turkite is going, oh, you know, a little worse for wear. And uh, yeah, so but yeah, the the VMC 15. If, it's a great little machine. No, and that will. So yeah. So when I got my shop, I didn't know how to run industrial CNC equipment. So I bought my machines, and I I had SolidWorks, and I added solid cam package to my SolidWorks, and I just sat down and I taught myself. I had all the Fidel manuals and a YouTube certified machinist, baby. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I learned how to to run the Fidel pretty good, uh, and I like. I mean that it just sticks with me. I love doing that kind of stuff, and it's that my background and, and just the way my mind works, it really was kind of easy for me and fun while I was learning how to do it. So I, I only crashed it twice. When I was if you're not crashing, you're not trying, it was nerve- right? <laughs> exactly. I, I might've had a, a few parts, uh, you know, f- fly out of the vice, but, uh, huh. it's, it's scary. Cause it's, but yeah, that was a lot of fun learning. Um, yeah. so, but hopefully I can be using that machine a lot more making making Good. 3D printers. <laughs> it's, it's a little using that machine to make 3D printer kits is way overkill for it. But, uh, uh, it's a fun <laughs> machine. I want another one. Once you have one uh, industrial CNC machine, you yeah. always want more. So uh, I, I have to ask, when you first built your CNC plasma, what was this control software you were using? It was, um, oh my gosh. It's what it was, Mach 3. It was Mach 3, but I had a Gecko 540 on it. Um, nice. It was a, I was using 48 volt power supply for it, and I had a, a torch height control from a company in Texas. And then I had a Hypertherm uh, Power Max 45. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, all the guys on that subform on CZ Zone were telling you how to like tap into the Hypertherm control so you could use it for your to trigger the torch on and off. And there was a guy actually in Oklahoma using his plasma table to make like brackets and stuff. So you can make your own plasma. Oh, nice. Yeah. I, my experience with CNC zone was a lot like your experience with Twitter lately, where a lot of people tell you that what you're doing that is working great is never going to work. Uh, (laughs) yeah, I I was listening to one of your previous podcasts and, uh, you built a CNC router out of wood. (laughs) Yeah. It works great. I'm totally for it's all that kind of stuff. Like, it ain't stupid yes. if it works, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. 
And Aaron, you were telling me last night you're learning how to mill and stuff. Yeah. How's that going? I've been kind of plugging away at it. Joe's actually coming over tomorrow to help move that mill from the garage down to my basement. What what kind of mill is it? Gosh, what is that? It's a it's a Denford micro mill, which was a uh-huh. company that built educational kits out of the Sherline CNC machine mills okay so it's like a little cnc mill yeah but they made it a cool little like turnkey cnc mill out of the sherline kit it has like an enclosure and it's got a safety switch and they actually uh put really nice industrial controls in the back of the machine uh that i completely removed but uh (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) um of course i kind of had to because um when I got the mill, it it only ran on the specific software that Denford wrote. And I contacted them and I was like, hey, I need a new license for this. And they're like, cool. That mill was bought in 1995 and we would be happy to sell you a copy. It runs on Windows 98 is the newest and it's $700 for a license. And I said, no. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, converted it to a Gerbil controller. Um, which killed me inside, but it works really well. And um, we're running a, uh, a BCNC with an image that Hobby Fab created before Hobby Fab with the way of the dodo. And um, it's a it's a nice little machine that works really well. And uh, it's very low risk in terms of trying things. So it's perfect for Aaron to cut his teeth on. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. It's just in my garage right now, and it's, like, super hot and humid. Yeah. And it's hard to stand out there for any length of time. Yep. yep. <laughs> I know how that is. I don't do any machining, or I try to avoid as much as I can over the summer. It's, yeah. It's not fun. So, I've got two final questions for you, Kyle. Go ahead. I'm really excited about those bare bones kits. A lot of people are. I'm working on it. Uh, thinking about doing a Kickstarter, maybe. I just don't have the funds right now to go out and be buying a bunch of stock, and I've got to working on the manuals and everything right now, but um, I should really start to worry about the funding because um got to figure out how to get all the stock in here and start start making that stuff. That's another discussion that I'm going to start having on Twitter with people and everything. Sorry, Aaron, I kind of interrupted you in your first question. Oh, that's fine. I was just going to ask you if you had any expected data when you are going to start trying that. That'll be discussed later. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I get it. And then you mentioned that you're probably going to open sourcing the design. Any idea what kind of license you're looking at? Um, no, no idea. I did. Well, I'd be were... happy to help you with that. Okay, good deal. Because I had no I'm idea well there versed. were different types of licenses. Oh, there's I will so say, many. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I've been kind of avoiding, you know, introducing my design to the, the community because it's. I really just kind of wanted to be ready, have kits in stock, or I kind of, I kind of make some money from it because this is this is my full time job now. I've. I love the open source and we wouldn't be talking if right now, if it wasn't for the whole open source community and drive and I'm going to open source my design. I'm kind of resistant to do that because I've had some very bad experiences with people taking and stealing my designs and I've had firsthand experience with them running off of my designs and and doing really well. And I'm kind of sitting here. Good for you. That was that was my design. So, I am I am going to release it, but and I do think that the Z system will show up on a lot more printers once the word gets out. So mm-hmm. it works really well, and uh, people are going to see how well it works. To kind of undermine that, what do you think about doing kits for the cheap printers using your Z system? Like you would manufacture those kits. As a retrofit. Yes, I have thought about doing that. I should just come up with an upgrade kit. I should buy a Prusa and just do an upgrade kit. And then here comes the bear upgrade kit. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I've been actually talking to that guy on Twitter. He's cool. And I have a lot of respect for him. And I've been thinking about buying a Prusa MK3 just to put his kit, you know, on it. Um, but yeah, I have thought about that, Joe. Um, and that's still, that's still a possibility. But I don't like to step on toes. So, that guy that made the bear kit, I'm not going to step on his toes. Definitely not. Um well, but I have some some ideas, and I have some ideas for for some competitors. I uh, wish we would have had time to talk about the rail core because I like that. And uh, well, that's kind of okay. So I guess to wrap it up is that's my. I'll, 
Yeah. I compared the, the 3D printer market in a, to like the, the custom PC market. I see where the knowledge is getting out there and everybody's kind of starting to get curious about building their own printers and modding them and everything. So I would really like to be one of the higher end suppliers for those kind of mods and higher end kits that you piece together. Um, and the, the best description so far that I've come up with to compare it to the market that I'm trying to create, or I'm hoping it's going to be there is like the, the custom built PC market for 3d printers and CNC machines. Cause I also want to get into some offering some CNC machines, not fully fledged, but some really, really rigid desktop mills and lathes. I think a, uh, a cool rigid desktop lathe with a, with a turret tool changer on it would be really cool. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How that would can be cool. I help? <laughs> I'll let you know. Um, Somebody who spent three days looking at lathes the last few. <laughs> go Tabletop Machine Shop. Go to his YouTube channel. He's got some really cool videos on just that. Tabletop Machine Shop. Okay. Remember that. Yeah. Go definitely check out his videos on YouTube. It's really cool. All right. Well, we're over the hour mark. Stupid hour. I could talk to you for like six more. Yeah. I know. Well, You're welcome back. I'm excited yeah. to... to finally be introduced to the community because i've i'm down here in mississippi and i don't have anybody to get nerdy with so <laughs> i think you have more people than you know probably yeah but um, hopefully they find you now hopefully hopefully, they hopefully they're people mm-hmm. you want to find you and i'm planning on being at earth good maybe La- last time we talked you weren't planning yet you were thinking about it i want to go because i definitely want to break into the community and and do some big things so so where can people follow you then if they want to keep they up with you? They can follow me on Twitter. I just got Twitter last week. So my Twitter handle is at machine underscore elite. That's basically it right now. Um, they can go to my website. It's kind of barren, but the website is elitemachineworks.com. And if you're really wanting to get in contact with me, you can contact me through the website or the Twitter, which the, the Twitter handle is machine underscore elite i think <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> all right well cool this was fun um yeah i could talk for many more hours about this stuff definitely so we'll wrap it yeah. up here we're gonna have to have you back a couple more times definitely yeah if you guys have some like guests that are kind of in line with what i'm doing um that would be a lot of fun for sure awesome well if anybody out there has any other questions they want to hear us talk about or any feedback on the episode, feel free to reach out to us at makersontap at gmail.com or on Twitter at makersontap. We're also on Facebook somewhere. It's at makersontap. Yeah, feel free to reach out to us then. Aaron's never there. For good reason. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So with that. Keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. Cast. 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 Cast.